Yeah, see, vernacular, yeah, it's debatable. Uh, I mean, some people accept it. Uh, we know the name of the, me I mean, meaning of the word varna is slave. So, therefore, it's not acceptable, even at that level, right? But as we know, the meanings of the words keep changing. And the more they use later, for example, Dalit, you know, it, it's not the same meaning that we have today when it was started. So, at some point, what was not acceptable becomes acceptable a little later. One could have reservations, but, you know, Big scholars today who have written about whether it is Ranajit Guha or Partha Chatterjee, they all have brought out volumes with the main title. Yeah. Vernacular, history in the vernacular is one of the titles. Right? Vernacular past is Ranajit Guha's essay. Uh, so it's become a little more acceptable now, but I, I understand your reservations. Yeah. The second thing about the, whether caste was uh, uh, explicitly used and whether it was said. And I have a very short essay that I have written about it which is published in the Anveshi uh, broadsheet. And it is mentioned very explicitly that when modern Telugu was supposed to be proposed, whose la when the de debate happened, it should be only the language of the Brahmins. Sister Vyavaharikam, people asked, what do you mean by Sister Vyavaharikam? And later on, they clarified that it is the language of the Brahmins spoken in the Krishna and Godavari districts. In the uh, Gurujad Apara was the minute. It is very clearly mentioned that he is proposing the language of that. Because they were accused by the pundits that when they said this is the modern spoken Telugu that should be, become the language, the pundits accused them the spoken Telugu is nothing but the language of the Malas and Madigas. And these people clarified in response saying, no, we are not proposing the language of the Malas and Madigas, we are actually proposing the language of the educated Brahmins from Krishna and Godavari district. So I've given all the citations from page numbers, etc., where the ex exact words that were used, the referred. Uh, so it, there was a discussion. The, just that when we have articles and books written about the spoken Telugu movement, this part is completely erased from those articles. So which is what I thought, okay, I should contribute that little bit and bring it back into the discussion. So, so the particular word Gramya Bhasha. Yeah. That is commonly used for all the It was defined differently, but when the leaders, when they were questioned, what do you mean by Gramyam, then they really explained. And in fact, I went back to the history. From 12th century onwards, I looked at all the grammar books, because that is where these terms were used. From 12th century, all grammar books say, Gramyam is the language of the Malas and Madigas and untouchables. And that should not be the uh, language of education and literature. So it's it's there in several grammar. I quoted all, all from all those grammar books. Now, grammar uh, can be the grammatical language. Also, can be grammar. In I'm talking about Maharashtra, okay. right? So grammar is where a lot of curse words, abuse words, <laughs> and acceptable expressions are used. They use grammar, and it basically comes from grammar, which is language. Village. So religious language. A villages language. So villages languages are unacceptable. Whereas the city people, Pune, for instance, which was the center of Peshwai, th those Brahmins, their language, which is not uh, that of the uh, villages, but of the educated city people. So Grammy is not just a caste language. Grammy has all other kinds of meanings also. In the case of Marathi, of course. That's how I began with. My own understanding was Gramya definitely should be village and it should be the, the division should be the village language versus the urban lang kind of a language or towns people's language etc. But it did take the caste turn. I mean I'll give you just one more example. When uh, uh, Kandukur Veeraselling, he is one of the biggest names in the Telugu, modern Telugu literature, when he translated Shakespeare's plays into Telugu, he changed the names of the characters. So Hamlet became Dharmaraj. And the villains in most of the plays became Dalits and Adivasi names. So you have all the heroes with upper caste names and all the villains, etc., are given the lower caste Every names. Every language has its own cultural borders, yeah. I suppose, because in Marathi, Shakespeare is translated. And the names are not Brahminical. The names are uh, from ancient kings and, you know, um, Kshatriyas. Yeah. So yeah, that's why. I mean, Dharmaraj is a Kshatriya, but its caste came, I mean, it's not a 
um, it, it's not a, it's not something that happened accidentally. These are chosen, carefully thought and chosen names. Language, yeah. language, it's own way of looking at uh, these names and the culture of Islam. Such a tempting discussion. Like I can't help but just add one point since you mentioned Ranjit Guha and all. Uh, English was and French was also vernacular, uh, and then uh, all our, our languages were vernacular. But also the history suggests, as you said, the history of usages, how uh, you know the politics of language, and it was overturned. I think uh, in in for us, uh, vernacular is a reminder of this politics and how it has been played and how it has been overturned, whereas. Uh, regional or uh, bhasha, I think, is a very depoliticized description at times, which takes away all this history. So, just putting it, and we can Thank discuss you. on that. Yeah. Uh, I would also like to respond to uh, Professor Anu's question. Uh, two things that I have in mind is Little Magazine movement have been very influential, very helpful. Uh, I think uh, in Bengal as well as in Maharashtra, uh, there is. And uh, by doing that, we, we have you know examples of Binoy Mojumdar, um, one of the very influential early Dalit poet who was published extensively in, in multiple little magazines. His house has been converted into a little magazine museum, and it's, uh, there is a little magazine fair every year uh, remembering him. Uh, of course, uh, the consolidated community uh, that we are seeing in this periodicals like Adul Badul, Dalit Kantha and all, we did not see in Little Magazine. But there was a lot of exchange of ideas and going on. May not be always exchange of, uh, you know, uh, sharing of space of publication or printing and such. Uh, the handout that I circulated with the covers of Adul Badul, Purnendu Potri, Ashish Banerjee, a number of people who are, uh, you know, doing the illustrations for Little Magazine were doing for these magazines. Uh, so, I think there has been a huge involvement as far as Bangla Dalit periodicals are considered. Uh, there is a lot of participations uh, from, uh, you know, uh, the upper caste uh, yeah. writers, illustrations. Yeah. I have a follow-up question. Just sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah please. Because when I met Bimal Bishash uh, around 2002-2003, he said that the big issue was that uh, the Communist Party was very supportive of little magazines but did not want to hear about caste magazines at all. And the only way I heard about Adol Badol was because I went to uh, Dondokarno. And Bengalis there told me about this magazine, showed me this magazine and told me, no, there are, uh, you know, Dalit magazines in West Bengal. But I had never heard of them. I had never seen them. And Bimal Bisha said, that, yes, there is a politics of refusing caste to enter the discourse of the left. And this is why I was asking you, you know, to problematize that relationship, especially, I think, in the 80s and 90s, right? There are a lot of debates about in Bengali also about using Dalit literature. And uh, the two sides involved in these debates are, of course, uh, people like Bimal Bishas at one side and, and the communists uh, who are also Dalits, who are coming from the Dalit community. See, not power so much. Uh, for example, uh, when we talk about, and we are digitizing, Pothu uh, Shanket, which started as early as, you know, in the late 60s as Kon Pothe, which way? Uh, it, it stopped and then uh, after a couple of years it started again, revived as uh, Shanket, Signaling the Road. That was the title. Now they uh, were seen initially as the communist uh, group of the Dalit people who are publishing. It's interesting we do not, uh, so when, when we read comparatively with others, the issues of Morit Jhapi. So we can see the huge difference over there, the point of view. It becomes day and night. Also, uh, we do not see, like, for example, uh, maybe Oikotan is another uh, periodical coming from that, that sort of, uh, you know, um, lineage, but appearing, uh, you know, in the late 80s, which for the first time used the word Dalit literature coming from the, you know, the communist Dalit affiliations in middle of 90s. So when we talk about, uh, just to, you know, put that in context that whether 
all these magazines that there were talking about uh, operations, the Bengali word for it, uh, Dalan, and different words for it, Dalit literature. We see the, this Pathushankit or Vikotan, uh, they are reporting of uh, you know, the massacres, their usage of the term. There is a lot, lot uh, to happen, which is happening probably in 1995. Uh, After 1995, uh, maybe in 2000. Yeah, so we had actually this discussion if. Uh, yes, and uh, the communists were in power since 79, yeah. right? Right. So nothing in the 80s and. Mm. Uh, we actually had this discussion very recently during our conference, uh, somebody who is working on Vaikotan. Uh, so this question was particularly asked and that's the source of uh, the answer I gave that when was the word Dalit started being used in this Dalit periodical that I think that was the date given to us 95, 96, not before that. So Rahul, do you have any response to Professor Maya's or was it a, was the suggestion to you to take? Or? No, I think uh, very briefly. Uh, I will make a point. So Deb, I must agree with Maya ma'am that there has been a tension between the communist kind of a framework and then the you know Dalit kind of a framework, no doubt about it. Uh, partly, I mean, it is also because as she has pointed out, uh, there was this Samyukta Maharashtra movement uh, and this Samyukta Maharashtra movement may have also added to why, uh, you know, um, Dalit periodicals or the discourses on caste and untouchability couldn't have been represented to the larger extent in the little magazines earlier uh, because then you know there was a larger fight because Maharashtra had to be sort of separated from Gujarat and all uh, so that that might be also one of the uh, you know reasons why uh, there was certain kind of tension and why this discourse could not uh, have been highlighted to the larger extent. Uh, there is also tension between uh, the Dalit movement itself. There is this magazine here, Manohar, which actually uh, brings out a piece uh, between the, 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 the fight the between yeah, Raja Dhali and Namdev Dasal. As you know, uh, Namdev Dasal was himself a communist. Uh, I mean, he believed more in the communist ideology and Raja Dhali uh, was more, you know, sort of uh, Buddhist kind of uh, inculcating all those values, Ambedkarite kind of uh, values. So those tensions are also there, definitely. But I think uh, we have not really started looking at the content of these magazines. We have procured them and we are, uh, we are in the process of digitizing. We will have to look at the content and then only probably we'll be able to make you know profound comment about it so I'm, I'm sorry for that but yeah definitely and there is this pan indian phenomenon also there is always a tussle between the communist ideology and the dalit ideology uh, obviously very quickly about the vernacular uh, the discussion on vernacular in fact this question was asked to me during our <laughs> review meeting that why Marathi is not vernacular, Bengali is not vernacular. So why are you using this, uh, you know, this term or this concept? So I uh, I was struggling, but I could say that it is not just the standardization of language, but it is also about uh, the nature and form in which certain writings were produced. Right? It, it it's a different language altogether. The expression of the language is different, and that is the context in which we are calling them as vernaculars. Right. Because the way you, you see, I mean, it's a standard process when it comes to print. Right. So that that was the point that I was trying to make, that it is also about the nature and form, the ideas which may not have been represented to, to the larger extent. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe just one small thing to wind up. I think there isn't time for uh, one more round of questions. So we have to close the session. So, so there's a, this now very significant, as you can see from their presentations, very significant, politically significant and politically charged field that is available somewhere, but someone has to discover it. Someone, and so what kind of research possibilities are available for this? So it was something that I wanted to ask them, but not now. I think discussion ha can happen over tea or other places. So thank you so much, both of you. And it's really great pleasure being here with you and listening to you. Thank, thank you, you for that.
So good morning, everyone. My great honor and pleasure to introduce to you today, Professor Pulikonda Subachari. Uh, he has retired from the Department of Folklore and Tribal Studies at the Dravidian University and is the chairman of its board of studies. He is also a poet and a literary critic. He has conducted his PhD on caste myths and dependent caste systems. And this book has opened new vistas of folklore research. He was awarded the Ramaraju Janapada Vijnaya Bahumati in 1991 for the book Structural Study of Telugu Wonder Tales and has been invited and has participated in numerous national and international workshops. Um, Professor Subachari is also the author of numerous books and articles. Um, he has organized the Poetry Festival of Dravidian Languages and edited the Dravidian, edit, and edited, uh, Dravidian poem and has been publishing in leading Telugu daily papers and news and magazines also. So, you know, uh, we are very happy to have you on our panel. Good morning. Uh, my, the title of my presentation is uh, The World of the Telugu Undertale and its uh, Social Dynamics. Uh, particularly, uh, there are two parts in my presentation. One is, I'm going to propose an idea. I Right now, I say an idea that I don't want to call it a theory. Uh, it's an idea that uh, there's no much difference between the wonder tale and a myth. And uh, how a myth is having a structure of uh, the wonder tale. And uh, what is the thin membrane that is there between uh, the wonder tale and uh, the myth that is one aspect and uh, i will uh, propose that particular new idea at the end of my deliberation and particularly in this presentation the second part of my presentation is uh, that is gender issues which were there in the wonder tale or the myth uh, particularly i have taken uh, the cases of uh, the goddess Ellamma. Uh, Samaka Saralamma and some other parental goddesses, Tiruputamma, Sri Lakshmamma, and so on. And uh, I would like to present the idea that what is a parentalu? Parentalu goddess. A parentalu is a goddess. So in Telugu, the, there is a one word that is called parentam. Parentam means a ritual, particularly a ritual that is meant for women. That is called parentam. And uh, it's a happy ritual, not uh, the uh, unhappy or uh, sorrow ritual. Uh, that's called that kind of woman-oriented rituals are called parentums. And the woman, unmar unmarried or unwidowed woman, who are participating in that particular kind of rituals, they are called parentalu. Parentalu means a woman who is participating in a particular ritual. She is called Parentalu and uh, a kind of goddesses also are called Parentalu Devata. Parentalu Devata means Parentalu Goddess. How a woman becomes a goddess? Then such kind of when a woman is deified, she is called Parentalu Devata. Parentalu Devata means Goddess of Parentalu. And this kind of Parentalu Goddesses may be different kinds. One kind of Parentalu is who is committed Sahagamana or who has killed or who committed herself on the pyre of her husband and died, after that she may become a goddess. And that is that is that kind of goddess is also a parental. And a woman who fought against thieves or who fought against some kind of bad persons and who are killed in such kind of a sacrifice also may become a goddess. She is also a parental goddess. And a woman who were killed by her in-laws, harassed by her in-laws, or killed by her husband, may manifest herself as a goddess. And such kind of goddess is also kind, called parental goddess. And a woman who died in an unusual or bizarre kind of e events, she may be also become manifest herself as a goddess. Such kind of goddess is also called parentalu goddesses. In coastal districts, right from Chittur to Srikakulam, 
all the coastal districts there are more than 220 deified perentalu goddesses across the coastal coastal districts and uh, there was an idea that in telangana there were there are no perentalu kind of goddesses but i found some perentalu goddesses in telangana also and particularly the samaka saralamma is a kind of perentalu goddess she fought against the kakatiya kings and she sacrificed herself in the war and in in these in these terms the samaka is also a perentalu goddess and batukamma is also a perentalu goddess in telangana and batukamma she was killed by her in-laws and her husband and after that she manifested herself as a goddess then she is also a perentalu goddess in in one in indian ethos and indian hindu kind of ideology we say that yatra naryastu pujyante ramante tatra devata tatra devata ramante what you can call it that means where the woman is worshiped there the gods and goddesses will be happy and uh, uh, they move there in the such kind of places that kind of place can be called as a, a sacred place that is in our tombs and uh, in our ethos it is there and even it is mentioned in many occasions but a woman can be become a goddess or she, she can herself manifest as a goddess only after her being harassed or being killed in the many of the events it is manifested there and it is manifested the the same kind of thing the woman is deified after she is killed maybe in because of maybe because of various reasons it happened so the myth of elamma it looks like more a wonder tale yesterday we heard the the myth of elamma the he sang and in many incidents that there was a swayamvara to elamma goddess and nobody could won that swayamvara competition and he has to high go high into the sky to ring the bell nobody could could do that and the finally the jamadagni muni entered into the scene and he was moving to that uh, place to the sankara the loka of the sankara and in between he came across the kalyani nandini the kamadhenu the daughter of the kamadhenu and he rescued that uh, that particular kamadhenu the daughter of the kamadhenu and she gave a boon because of that boon the jamadagni muni rose to the height of the sky and ring the bell that this kind of character it is called the donator donor donor this is one element in the 31 elements 31 functions of the propian theory that's why i propose an idea that most of the myths most of the myths of the goddesses they have the structure structure many structural patterns which are there in the wonder tale those structural patterns build a myth here also the myth of elamma if you closely scrutinize the structure of the elamma tale elamma myth it looks like a wonder tale that is my another proposal of that idea that a myth is also a wonder tale but only the small slightest difference between a wonder tale and a myth is a myth is considered as a sacred narrative it is sacred we worship it whereas wonder tale is not worshiped wonder tale is not a sacred one that's only the little difference okay now we are looking at the the myth of the elamma the story of the elamma the goddess elamma she is the wife of the jamadagni and uh, she used to bring the water from the river nearby river to the ashrama of the jamadagni and uh, she has a she has a kind of a miracle she has a strength that divine power that uh, she goes to the river side without taking any pot or any vessel and she goes there she brings some sand she makes a pot immediately with the power of her her miracle she makes a pot of sand and she brings the water in the pot which is made out of the sand and brings to the obligation oblations to the of her husband and she gives the water then he performs the puja and the tapas etc etc at the ashram but one day she went to the river side she find a couple a couple of gandharvas they are making love and they are at a good romantic mood and they are moving in such a way in the making love and she look at that particular couple and she felt she felt that kind of similar kind of feeling that 
how it looks like that i wish that my husband should also behave like this and should also make love with me she felt like that and uh, after that feeling that she could not make the part out of the sand she could not bring and uh, she got back to the ashram at the empty hands and then the jamadagni muni she, she he found that her mind is polluted and uh, she looked at the couple who are making love and she felt the same to have some kind of that kind of uh, romantic and uh, amorous that kind of feeling and she is her mind is polluted and she should be punished and he has they have five sons and then when the he called the biggest son and uh, kill your mother and he did not accept and because of that arrogance he was killed he was cursed to die he did and all the other three sons did the same and finally he asked the parashurama and he is very wise and clever what he did is and uh, he took his axe and uh, cut off his the head of her mother and then the jamadagni asked what kind of bone you want from me because you followed my order and you killed your own mother then the parashurama very wisely cleverly got uh, requested a boon that my mother should got back to the life and all of my other brothers who were killed by you were cursed by you should also bring back to the life that is all the bring back but according to some other other stories other versions of the myth uh, she ran away to avoid the parashurama's killing she ran away and went into the uh, madiga gudam and uh, she embraced a madiga woman and uh, she parashurama chased to that place and uh, then he behead the, uh, the he gave a stroke and uh, the heads of uh, the both the dalit woman and the elama were fall down then when they are bringing them back to the life the heads are changed mm-hmm. heads are changed the ma, the head of the madiga woman went to the elam the brahmin uh, body and uh, the head of the brahmin uh, woman went into the dalit woman so this kind of thing happened here my point is after the killing of the woman she manifested herself as the goddess and uh, the goddess elam she is worshiped across south india and not only south india i went in i even i found the renuka festival renuka jatra in punjab renuka jatra in uh, haryana himachal pradesh and renuka worship is there in north east assam wherever you go but my concern is here i found that i collected this elamma myth in uh, this is uh, one uh, temple is there here the near to karnool and uh, that is uh, the amala amalapuram not amalapuram that is uh, it is near uh, in madha mahbub nagar district one second i just it's not coming into my jogulamba 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 temple one more minute <laughs> my god this all i i am talking no, only for talking. regarding only one goddess five, five okay me, and uh, then i have to mention other other, other goddesses also but here uh, then jogulamba then the amala dan uh, temple parent that is alampur uh, alampur alampur temple alampur jogulamba then actually this incident happened in alampur jog near alampur on on the river bank of the tungabhadra nadi actually elamma is a local goddess but similar kind of happening similar kind of killing of mother happened in the myth of general myth of all indian pan indian myth of that is renuka after some years these two myths are synchronized assimilated the local myth of elamma is assimilated with the sanskrit myth renuka after that she become renuka elamma renuka elamma but actually this incident happened in uh, alampur jogulamba because how can i say that when the goddess elamma is killed her body fallen there in the near to the temple of balabrameshwara temple near to that place and her head rose to the sky and fallen in a nearby village that is called undavalli even today 
the body of the uh, the headless body is worshipped near to the bala brahmeshwara temple before the bala brahmeshwara temple mm-hmm. and only head of the elama which is fallen the, in the madiga palli madiga gudem they built a temple to the head and the he- only head is worshipped in that undavelli village i went to, to these two places i interviewed many people and i interviewed the uh, persons also they told that the head is fallen here hence the head is being worshipped there and even today uh, that i show that particular photo that is the lajja gauri the naked woman uh, that is opened her legs for uh, it is actually how can i say that it is the posture of uh, before having a sex and uh, that is uh, the private part is opened there and uh, no there is no head and uh, a new couple who didn't have offspring they go there it is totally closed nobody other is allowed only the uh, childless couple they can go there they can put some kind of butter on the private part of that particular the lajja gauri and the woman has to lick that butter they believe that they will have offspring they will have children after that this puja this kind of puja today it is also believed that one so the other evidences other evidence they give you a strength that the incident happened alampur at that place then the myth is spread across the many places of that this one after many centuries this is synchronized and assimilated with the pan indian myth that is called renuka and after that she become renuka elamma so in a brief within 2 3 minutes i'll mention some other uh, places that uh, i brought some visuals of samaka sarlamma jatra similar kind of similar kind of fashion the samaka did not born as a usual woman she born we don't know the uh, according to the myths of the samaka she did not born to a woman she manifested herself as a goddess little baby and according to one version of the myth the raya bandani raju the father of the um, samaka for a long time they didn't get he has three wives but uh, he didn't get uh, offspring out of these three wives and they uh, they adopted many kind of tapas and uh, pujas vratas all these things after many after a long time they went into a forest and uh, they were trying to dig out some kind of uh, roots edible roots to eat then to the peacocks the the metal kind of sound came out and they dig out and they, uh, they found a uh, box metal box they opened the box they, they to their surprise they found a girl baby girl and uh, that become the goddess samak and according to other version of the myth uh, when they were moving in the forest one ba- they heard the cry of a baby they went there they found that four tigers they are protecting they are guarding the baby crying baby and uh, they are gr- actually they are bringing up that baby and uh, after looking at these uh, raya bandani raju and, and his wives the tigers left and they brought the baby and uh, they grow they brought up the baby and uh, after that she become the samaka goddess samaka and she fought against the kakatiya kings one point i mentioned here that the exit of the uh, samaka is also one version say that she was killed in the battlefield and uh, she was beheaded beheaded and had had is fallen there at one place and the, at the same place she is being worshiped today also after 700 years it happened 700 years ago but today she is worshiped at that gadde and uh, according to other version you can show that i, I can show that i can show yeah. according to other version and she was not killed in the battle she was seriously injured and then with that injury she left that place and she went into the top of the hill top of the hill that is called chilukala gutta even today that chilukala gutta is there and i'll show that picture also and in that chilukala gutta after going the top of the hill she disappeared and one kind of kunkuma bharine we call it a small casket of vermilion it was found there and and people the that kunkuma bharine is symbolized as the goddess of the samaka and when the jatra begins they brought this kumkuma bharana to the gadde and then it is sanctified as it is invited invoked as the goddess 
and the goddess will be there only for four days there on that that day. After that, and she is identified in a tree. And in tribal religion, idolatry is not there. They worship. They do not worship the gods or goddesses in the form of the human form. They worship as the form of a tree. Even today, the tree is there. I'll show. I'll show that uh, picture of that tree. And uh, so, with the mentioning of the these two goddesses. I think maybe you can. Show yeah, yeah. I'll show. I'll stop I it here. One one important point I would like to make. Uh, two points are that is, my proposal is, a myth is also a wonder tale. and there are lot of structural uh, similarities are between these two genres that is one point and the other point is yes women is worshiped women is deified only after her death at in the other uh, in, when she is alive the treatment the social treatment and uh, she is a second gender and uh, okay l- l- other things are there let l- l- now we can go for this uh, visuals and people used to climb down to the dade and they the felt that it is being desecrated by the food so they made this this cage but symbolically this cage this round cage it is looking like that the goddess is cage mm-hmm. uh, actually personally i don't want this kind of cage should be there but uh, actually they made it but uh, the other other places are there where we can find the uh, goddess samaka okay i will go for this one i will clear this one on the backdrop you can find the a hill on the backdrop you can find a hill that one yes it is stopped there this 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 hill it is called chilukala gutta and the goddess is manifested there itself so on the beginning day of that uh, one the pujaris uh, they brought the kumkuma bharana from the top of the hill and the other days general people they are scared to go to that hill and they believe that the goddess will be there and uh, uh, she won't accept uh, to anybody to climb up to that uh, uh, hill top and still today it is called the entire hill is considered as a sacred one that is called chilukala gutta and uh, the goddess hill is uh, lives goddess lives there but uh, the goddess become powerful and uh, the she will have the kind of uh, holy or uh, sacrality will be established only four days and uh, this gadda and the, that tree and that gadda become very sacred only for that four days all the other days it is not there and one thing very interesting thing is magha purnima magha masa it, it comes under in the month of february or march and magha purnima is the common festive day for all the parental goddess that is very interesting that's why the tirupatham goddess tirupatham at panaganjipur lo krishna district and the goddess uh, lingalapadu that is uh, uh, sri lakshmamma goddess that, that is at uh, lingalapadu near uh, krishna district also that is also happens in magha purnima magha purnima and uh, nearby that is uh, durajpalli gattu also it is nearby all, all around the those days but it falls in the month of february so all the parentalu goddesses are worshiped on that particular magha purnima day so we have to note that this samaka is also considered as the parentalu goddess he is one uh, the descendant of uh, the pujaris of uh, chanda vamsham that's called and uh, this person this boy this uh, in pujari of uh, this he narrated uh, the entire the process of uh, ritual process to me yeah you see this this is one shrine actually there was a hut was there long ago a attached hut was there here where some images of wooden images symbolic images they did not allow me to go inside to um, grab some pictures but here actually the shrine was there here all the other 360 days the goddess El, uh, samaka was worshiped here at that particular the pujari um, uh, clan and uh, earlier days the bali But the sacrifice of uh, uh, birds and animals were there was there near to the gadde uh, because uh, the governmental kind of uh, restrictions the bali the sacrifice yeah. is uh, taken away from the temple and uh, so my contention here is that the intervention of the intervention of the government should not be there in the ritual processes it should not be there it should be allowed allowed what they do it 
you cannot uh, stop the of course the animal sacrifice is banned across but uh, the animal sacrifice of one religion is banned the other religion the sacrifice of other religion is not at all banned that is one very important point where to okay i i'll stop here yeah. and many other photos are there of course we well, i'll stop it here this is enough and we can go for uh, some discussion uh, professor rituparna patgiri uh she has a phd in sociology from jnu and uh, the reason i know ritu parna is that she is one of the co-founders of this amazing podcast called doing sociology where she goes around interviewing uh, various social scientists especially sociologists and anthropologists and so it's an academic blog promoting sociological consciousness among uh, young people uh so ritu parna is also the associate editor of the journal south asian religion and society and currently working on a monograph on mobile theater of assam a story of resistance consumption and culture and she has co-edited uh the the following books the social nature of food in india and sociology of gender in india contemporary issues and perspectives and these two books are going to come out very soon right yes and so uh she has also taught at indrapasta college for women at delhi university and at jamia millia uh islamia university and she explores culture food media gender and pedagogy and strives to make academic knowledge accessible to all so ritu parna the floor is yours thank you so much thank you uh, anu uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and be a part of this session i would also like to thank nicole and judith and the organizers i'll try to be as crisp as possible and keep it to 10 minutes so uh, as anu already mentioned uh, my phd was on mobile theater for sam something that not a lot of people are familiar with and i can see that uh, most of the audience also doesn't look like from the northeast or assamese and here goes my uh, racist stereotyping but uh, therefore probably it would be more interesting to talk about mobile theater as well uh, in this 9 uh, and a half minutes i want to talk about how uh, storytelling happens in drama and why is it important so for that i have actually thought about talking about three kinds of theater one is uh, what we know of as folk theater the second is modern indian theater and the third is mobile theater and all three from the context of assam because of the paucity of time i'm going to sort of use the word assamese loosely meaning people who reside in the region that we know of as assam rather than going into the intricacies of who an assamese is at this moment so the history of theater in assam is actually very rich and historical because the first form of theater was written in the 15th century by a neo vaishnavite saint called shrimanta shankar deva and he coined this form of theater called onkya nat which means one act play primarily to show uh, krishna and vishnu's uh, ways of uh, life to promote neo vaishnavism amongst people the significance of this was that at that time uh, assam was riddled with shakti worship and also a lot of animal sacrifice and idol worship neo vaishnavism was an intervention in that direction that uh, wanted to promote a religion which was free uh, more or less of casteism because one of shankar deva's primary ideas was also to eliminate brahmins or priests who would be the mediators between god and the devotees so onkya nats or those four homes of stories were actually directed towards masses who were not able to read and write uh, properly particularly in sanskrit which was seen as a brahmanical language i think i would also draw from the very excellent uh, panel before ours in which they talked about language and this intervention is important because shankar deva coined a different language itself called brajawali which was a mix of maithili and hindi uh one can also see how it's maithili and hindi coming together sorry uh, sorry uh, not hindi a uh, maithili and bengali so one could see that there was a mix of the two languages which were very close to what assam as a region is 
these onkya nats have also taken on modern representations because even today in several corners of the uh, uh, state people do watch onkya nats the name has changed today we call it bhavna bhavna is also an art form uh, that is very indigenous to the region and i'll go to this question of indigeneity which is very important in that context so if the content of these plays were religious in the 15th century and 16th century what is the content today well the content still remains religious but there is a very modern twist and representation to it so in a way the bhavanas have become ways in which uh, there is a possibility to exhibit technological advancements so while earlier all the actors would be male today of course there are also female actors as well as transgender actors in those religious plays Uh, at the same time earlier they would perform all the songs and dances in the venue itself in a live mode but today they are able to combine some of it with pre-recorded events which they can sort of just insert in between these onkya nats or bhavanas so this is one kind of storytelling that has happened the second is of modern assamese theater again this has a history from the 18th century itself when a very huge complex of theater called ban theater was built in tejpur which is a historic city which finds mentions in hindu epics like mahabharata now in that period it's also interesting to see the influence of shakespeare on assamese theater because tragedy became incorporated into the storytelling mode and the first modern assamese play as we know of as modern theater came out in 1857 by someone called gunabhiram barua who is not a brahmin uh, because barwas are not uh, the traditionally upper caste they are actually uh, a mix of ahoms who used to be erstwhile rulers in uh, the 13th century as well as they are seen as a middle caste who took up an issue called widow remarriage which also find resonance in that period in other parts of the country and this play struck a very important chord in very different ways with the population that watched it the reason being that it was a very sensitive issue as widows were not allowed to remarry in also the kind of hinduism that assam followed and one can see that the impact of neo vaishnavism had crept in a little bit at that time because shankar deva had also promoted widow remarriage where it was very tough to do it in the 15th 16th century but this play sort of broke a lot of grounds because the audience reacted differently in different places so in regions where shakti was the main i uh, you know uh, main deity uh, who was worshiped there was more adverse reaction whereas in regions of assam where neo vaishnavism is followed it was easier to screen or stage the play because they were already familiar with what is known as widow remarriage through shankar deva's interventions so again the question of gender the question of marriage kinship family became very important and i just pick one play here uh, to illustrate how storytelling in drama has that impact and the play is also interesting because he kept it in a way that people would not really get into the story immediately and think about the plight of the widow he kept it humorous he uh, the director kept it in a way that it would captivate audiences and then sort of they get to the end of what the message is so the message is very important in this context the third part of the storytelling is about mobile theater which is a very unique kind of theatrical tradition of assam which is not folk theater or modern theater itself primarily because these are theater groups that travel from one part of the state to the other uh, staging different kinds of plays they are very technologically advanced they have two stages simultaneously running so if performance is happening in one stage the other stage which is called the advanced stage is actually being set in preparation so that as soon as the scene ends in the running stage the advanced stage could open up so the importance of mobile theater is that it is public friendly because the theater group travels from one place to another so the theater is taken to the public
right? So it means that you may not have a multiplex, you may not have a proscenium theater hall, but you can have mobile theater in these villages. Just to give a very quick example of how this works, most of the actors and actresses actually stay with the villagers during the duration of the performance, right? And that gives them a sense of very different kind of community building. Interesting part is also that mobile theater is performed by people from different castes in Assam, different religions. So there are Muslim producers, Muslim actors, there are, uh, you know, uh, people from the lower caste. I'm not consciously using the word scheduled caste here, primarily because as most of you would be aware of, the question of caste takes on a different position in the context of Assam. So, the question of indigeneity now, uh, and I remember that when we were doing this dialogue, I said that uh, we shouldn't use the word Adivasi in the context of Assam, but indigenous. The reason being that there is a very uh, strong resistance uh, in favor of the indigenous people. And most of you know that Assam has also been in the news for advocating the National Register of Citizens, primarily during the anti-CAA movements in 2019. The reason is this that they see people who have been born and brought up and people who have claims to the land as indigenous. So the Adivasis would be seen as people who work in the tea gardens and they are not seen as indigenous because they are seen as imported unfortunately during the British rule to work in tea plantations which is why this contrast of the term. And that is why it also becomes volatile politically because if you are talking about Adivasi rights, immediately it is taken to mean that you are talking about migrant rights rather than indigenous rights which is about the sons of the soil movement. And this is where the intervention in terms of storytelling can also be seen. So I will just give one or two examples from a play called uh, Kanaklata. Now, Kanaklata is actually a freedom fighter from the region who um, unfortunately finds not much, uh, not much mention in mainstream historical accounts. But her story is important for the so-called indigenous context because she is one of these women who fights for the rights of uh, Assamese independence uh, during the British uh, colonial rule. And her story is glorified in dramatic representations to talk about the role women and uh, women from Assam have played in sort of bringing out stories of bravery to the you know center stage. Similarly, when one thinks about Assam movement, which was this great movement uh, in terms of resistance to the state, but at the same time, it also had this element of being very anti foreigner, particularly the word foreigner was used to mean Bangladeshis, Bengalis and Biharis also. So Assam has also been riddled with these very anti-foreigner, which are also seen as very anti, you know, uh, other, uh, other cultural movements. One of the primary reasons is that language takes on a key role in this context because uh, when we were talking about language in the previous uh, plenary also, the focus was uh, much on about language within the state. But in Assam, the juxtaposition is primarily with Bengali. So to have plays in Assamese then is a moment or a mark of resistance that claims its indigeneity. So because we know that Bengal has a very rich theatrical movement and the competition is therefore not within, it is outside. In a way, it's also quite uh, interesting to observe how uh, a region that sees itself as neglected and marginalized often juxtaposition, uh, juxtaposes its cultural artifacts, relations, objects and of course phenomena with the you know uh, uh, neighborly uh, opposites and in many cases also what they see as perhaps an enemy. So that is rooted in a very historical uh, sense of location of language and drama has played a key role in it. So when mobile theater started and I'll just end in two three minutes Yes, one minute. And when mobile theater had started, the initial idea was that it would be plays in Assamese language. It would be indigenous plays. Now, what that indigeneity means is debatable because even when we are talking about indigeneity, we are not actually representing the tribes. We are actually representing a lot of caste Hindus and you know people who would rather identify only as caste Assamese. So because it is not about plays from tribes which are actually maybe you know endangered in terms of 
numbers or language like be it the Mishings in Upper Assam or even the Karbis in Lower Assam. So, the politics of indigeneity is very political, very social. There is an assertion of dominance in terms of indigeneity, but we often forget to question what that indigeneity means. And as an insider, I think that is my reflexivity in also thinking through what being an Assamese means and how drama has sort of represented it through multiple entry points. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Itubarna. Thanks for keeping time. Okay, so I would prefer us to have uh, time for discussion, so 10 minutes. So I will try to very quickly uh, summarize what I wanted to say. Br very briefly, I wanted to talk about the uh, Potuas uh, who are from Midnapur, who are a group of people who have traditionally been uh, Muslim. Uh, but Muslims on the march of society. So basically, they were not allowed to have their own mosques and they lived by, uh, they say begging, but actually what they had were these amazing scroll paintings, lives um, of uh, gods and goddesses that they would sing from village to village and they would live on, on the arms that were got. The reason why I wanted to talk about them in relation to gender is that in this community, it is the women who make the money. Uh, the men stay at home, uh, very often look after the children. If they have land, look after land. And it has been the women who have been in power. And when I did some field work amongst them, I found that there were many men who had been lost, quote unquote, to their families. So one had been a heroin addict that his parents had kicked out. He was one of the guys that the women wanted to join the village. Another one was a Bangladeshi refugee who had, basically he had crossed the border when he was 17 or 18. He had been beaten up. He had said that, you know, he had come to India to try and make money to, to, to get a job. He had not been able to, so he didn't want to go back to Bangladesh. And he had got married to one of these women. And they said, you know, we try to look for orphans. And I said, why is that? That way they stay with us. They stay in the village. We don't have to go to the men's house. So it's a, it's kind of a matrilineal system. Okay, it's very interesting because they live from painting and singing. And now that um, a lot of Bollywood actors have uh, discovered, quote unquote, their art and have bought their paintings, some of them have got very rich. They have decided to build a mosque. And when I was talking to the mullah, the new mullah of the mosque, he said, you know, this is all haram. I'm going to stop them painting and singing. They have enough money to buy land and become good Muslims. So it was for me interesting because a lot of women kind of kept resisting, saying, this is what we've always done. We need, we, we want to work uh, with this. So I just wanted to put what I've said in conversation with um, what Professor Subhachari and uh, Professor Padgiri have said, very, very rich papers, uh, this whole uh, idea around yellow mind, from the little I know, actually, because I'm an anthropologist, so I look at it from a different angle. I look at how basically these myths might have, or the theater might have a repercussion on people's daily lives. And from what I know is that the Devdasis were married to Yelama and became the mama to their family. So became the man figure, the brother that perhaps the Dalit parents could not, the, the son that the Dalit parents could not have. And very often were the ones to provide for the nephews and nieces of the maternal house or paternal house. So this is something for me that was very interesting in relation to this Yalama story. We can maybe talk more about the, in, like for, from, this is what I'd like to start off with, you know, the, the, how, how do these stories really change people's perceptions of gender and how they uh, conduct themselves? And for me, it was in an ethnography by Lucinda Ramberg, um, given to the goddess that she, the, her whole book on, is on Yalama and on the Devdasis. And I found this very interesting that they took on the role of the mama, you know, in the, the, the mother's brother, right? Um, and Rituparna, for you, you know, very interesting, this whole story of indigeneity and uh, Assamese identity and how in the 15th century, basically, it was used to uh, question caste and caste hierarchies. 
how how have these theaters or these plays been used today to perhaps uh, talk about women's empowerment? So in both cases, I wanted that. And then uh, we will open it up once um, to the floor so that we can have lunch. I know a lot of you are hungry. So don't worry, we will finish early. So you, you want to, who wants to go first? Oh, anybody, no problem, no problem. Yes. To no. the Lama and uh, the Mama figure of the Devdasi. <laughs> they, have, have you come across that? You know, the, the importance of how these myths can be used in people's daily lives for empowerment of women, right? Because we're talking of gender also. Like, to what extent are women talking about Yalamma to uh, assert certain rights? Do you, do you find that in, in where you've done field work? No, this is uh, uh, the entire ritual process or worship uh, of uh, Goddess Ellamma. And uh, one particular, in Bhavavunagar district, one village, we found that one uh, Devadasi family is the pujari of that particular Ellamma. And uh, when the ritual starts, that pujari, that woman should come there. And she got that family, entire family and uh, that particular caste there in that particular uh, district. Their social status is elevated. Mm. And uh, she is worshipped like a goddess her herself. For in those all the ritual days, she is treated as a the, the goddess itself. And in the cult of Malanna, the Malanna, Malanna is considered as the brother of Elama. And when the three months of ritual time is there of uh, Malana, the god of Malana, there a male person can become Malana himself and a female person, a male person also become, can, can convert himself as the goddess Elamala. And uh, the person wear a sari and, uh, and guys in the form of a woman and he will continue for three months and uh, one week before the Sankranti, the persons they man, they convert themselves into Malanna and Elamma, and till the Bugadi, and almost for three months, they remain in the status of uh, the god Malanna and goddess Elamma. And all these three months, they are treated as goddess and the god, mm. and they are worshipped mm. also. After the third month, the final ritual of the Malanna, they entered into the, the pyre, the fireplace. And they, they purify themselves and they enter into the sanctum sanctor of the god Malana and they give away their godly status to the god and they came out. Here symbolically, they get a new kind of social order, social hierarchy, social elevation because of the changing of the, that, that happens. But this mama figure, mama pattern is not there in Telugu land. It's not there. Only Karnataka. It's not there here. Please. Well, when I think about uh, women's empowerment and gender, I think it's interesting because when one looks at uh, particularly mobile theater, there are only, uh, you know, groups that are run by women. So the representation is both in the story and also outside the story. So uh, interestingly, the most uh, highest paid actor in the industry of mobile theater is right now a woman. So they sell it as a very woman friendly industry and how acting can become also a tool for you to be empowered, which is uh, very contrasting to what had happened to the first Assamese actress, Ideo Hendik, who was coerced into playing uh, the role of a wife in uh, the first Assamese film, Joy Muti. And then nobody married her because she had to use the word dear husband in the film itself. So the taboo was so strong that she couldn't get married afterwards. So it's interesting how there is a movement now towards women's empowerment. And there are a lot of women centric uh, plays that are done, like be it, you know, I already mentioned Konok Lota. But then there's another uh, play that was done in 2021 uh, after the pandemic sort of uh, was normalized a little bit, Mula Gabhoru 
which was about this uh, tribal uh, heroine who fought the British. So a very indigenous kind of woman's role uh, to say how, you know, women are strong, yet there are these, you know, uh, ideas of women not being strong enough in uh, the real world. So the story takes you to another sense of women's empowerment. Uh, the other story which uh, has focused on women is a play called uh, Shoti Beula. And um, Beula's story is also found in, I think, Bengal because uh, she brings back her husband to life after he's being bitten by a snake. And that is because of her pious nature. So there is also a juxtaposition. On the one hand, there's focus on empowerment in the sense of like courageous things and doing so-called, you know, jobs, fighting the British. But at the same time, also staying true to your feminine duties of caring for the husband or the domestic part of it. So there are ways, multiple ways in which it is represented. Yes, thank you very much for the panel. And <laughs> thank you very much for the panel. And precisely because, you know, more time was spent on the on the first paper. So maybe we can catch up on the second one in the discussion. So that, uh, you know, yes, and our newspaper as well. So, you know, please <laughs> bear that in mind. Um, so I have a quick question about content. You know, so it was fascinating, I mean, that, that, uh, the, the way you described drama and also the, the intersections between drama and cinema in Assam. But I have a question about, you know, the content of those plays. So if you could, you know, say a few more things about that. The content about the plays. The plays, yeah. Thank you for your extensive, uh, <laughs> extensive presentation in short time. Sir Pulikonda Subbarao Garu. Subbachari, sorry. Uh, he's a great contributor of uh, folklore uh, literature. Not only contributor, he's making like a uh, folklore uh, world and academic world. He's making some bridge between uh, academician and folklore literature. Uh, he's a big source uh, for uh, scholars and like me. Uh, I'm fan of uh, Subhachari Garu and I have a so many questions, but I am asking only small question. Now, uh, you said specifically Maga Pournami. Maga Pournami. What is the significance of Maga Pournami? And uh, it's um, uh, connected with the goddesses. Uh, Maga. I heard so many metaphors in the Maga. Magi Puddu, Maga Masam, Magi, Ma. Um, like that. But what is the parentum and magamasam goddesses and maga Pournami? Is there any significance in your observation? As the panel consists of uh, variant papers and all, my question is, is there uh, a question to the lady first and you? And uh, it is that, is the representations in the fiction, the women representation, irrespective of men writers or women writers, they are true to true to the real lives because uh, we have working women, we have uh, wor working women in all aspects from corporate to these things and uh, um, <coughs> women on the whole uh, are there because we can see in the in the indigenous literatures and in the folklore in the oral narratives we see the strong women portrayals at least at par with that. Uh, however, the condition of the representation of woman in fiction, why it is lopsided and why it is not bridging, uh, bridging a connection between the two. Because all of us, we know, uh, even when the representations also, we do not accept the fact that the, the portrayal of the characters and the real we, real we are different. So how to bridge this gap? Somewhere we have to come uh, reach to this. To you is uh, during 1860s, 70s, we see in Kolkata a number of plays being performed. Behula uh, is one of them, very important figure. Uh, as we see in uh, the Bangla theater, theater scenario of the time, they are also dealing with uh, very important the question of growing nationalism, uh, imagination of uh, you know the Bharat Mata, and uh, you know, fighting against the British, but also also negotiating with the repression on theatre, banning of them. So if 
Shoti Behula is being banned from performance. They will release another script, same play. Maybe this time they call uh, Lokhinder's Behula. So uh, how was uh, uh, you know uh, the SMS theatre scene negotiating with these ideas at that time? If you can comment on it. Connect all the questions and try to answer. First of all, I think about the representation, particularly from the SMS context. The problem is that there are uh, rarely uh, women playwrights who uh, write for either modern theatre or mobile theatre. So therefore, the representation is primarily skewed. I've only seen one or two directors and producers come up now. And even uh, there are novel writers, a lot of Assamese uh, women novel writers were very popular like um, Indira Goswami or Arupa uh, Patangya Kalita. But you don't have playwrights. Play has been some, for some reason a more of a masculine domain. And I think that is why the representation is very skewed in the Assamese context. I sincerely believe that because novels have done a better job. The second uh, and the third questions about the content of the plays and the uh, resistance and uh, crackdown. Well, uh, you know, so there's been a transformation in the content of the plays in the uh, 1800s or so, or actually before that, and then the 1800s has been more religious and nationalistic. Then came a period where socio-historical content was ruling. So in the uh, uh, period after independence, when there was a lot of, you know, poverty, unemployment, flood, there have been a lot of plays on floods in Assam because flood is this you know burning issue then there have been a lot on unemployment also uh, in between interestingly there were also plays on HIV AIDS because there was this buzz about HIV AIDS growing as a very uh, you know unique and big medical threat then in the 1990s as we see there is a transformation in terms of commercial plays so in 1997 the assamese theatrical landscape changes because titanic is staged in mobile theater and bbc sends a team to cover it that video is still available on youtube and that sort of changed the way people started taking to mobile theater and the group that staged uh, uh, Titanic in 2019, right before the pandemic hit, actually earned a revenue of 10 crores in a year, which is a huge number. <laughs> yes. Then uh, there have been plays like, you know, Anaconda, uh, because you see that there is a movie which has do done so well, so you adapt it in the local context. Then there was Jurassic Park as well. So very keeping in mind with the global and the local and the national, there was an adaptation of Kabhi Kushi Kabhi Kam because it became this very big Bollywood hit. So the content is diverse, but as a sociologist or as a social scientist, I see it also as a transformation from maybe a very democratized kind of public opinion to also a mediatized form of, you know, consumerist public culture. About the resistance part, I think it's very interesting because this would happen in Assam also, that when there is resistance against a particular play, they would just rename it or rather, you know, change one or two uh, characters and then uh, bring it out in another form. So that was also a way of resistance. Interestingly, uh, in Assam, the British also were not very familiar with the region and the geography. A lot of historians, particularly British historians, call the region land of witchcraft. Uh, Mayong particularly is an area which is still feared even today as the region where you can be turned into, you know, animals by the people. And I remember that Tarun Gogoi in one of the election campaigns when he was alive actually said that, uh, this was his arrogance speaking, that uh, Hindi speaking nationalist people cannot make inroads in Assam because we will just turn them into animals. He was, he was using that colloquial and stereotype that existed. So what I'm trying to say is uh, for the British also it was difficult to crack down because they were not really familiar with the topography, the geography and the language. And there were several versions of Assamese that existed at that point. So they would just, you know, change one or two words, letters, and these plays would also be performed in very small uh, gatherings. So uh, there are these uh, Ojhapalis which would be performed in marriage ceremonies. So you know, how can you control that? 